Let's go, let us unleash the tiny giants. Hey there, <laughs> to be honest, it's a bit weird to talk so much about myself. However, I want to introduce myself to you, to the audience. My name is Matthias Wacker and I'm a researcher at the National University of Singapore. I work particularly in the field of nanomedicine, which is also an important field because we are developing the next generation of cancer medicines. So at the moment with COVID-19, everything is about virology, but also think about the other diseases. I will introduce you to what we are doing in translational nanomedicine. And I hope that you enjoy this presentation. <laughs> when it comes to my research, one very important question is what nanomedicine actually is. And here I follow a definition of the US FDA. Nanomedicine is an offshot of nanotechnology which refers to highly specific medical intervention at the molecular scale for curing disease or repairing damaged tissues, such as bone, muscle or nerve. What you can see in the background of this slide, these are nanoparticles that we synthesized in our own laboratories. These are human serum albumin carriers and we encapsulated these tiny little black dots, which are iron oxides that can be used for diagnostics. What are nanomedicines good for? Today we use them very often in cancer therapy and this also has particular reasons. On the one side we encapsulate the drug to protect the drug from degradation in the human body but at the other end we also protect the patient from toxicity because when the drug is encapsulated it cannot be active in the body, it has to be released from the carrier. And this is a way to control the toxicity which comes very often with cancer therapy. One thing I'm particularly interested in as a researcher are the mechanisms of drug release. If we want to protect the patient from a compound, we have to control this important property. Also, it plays a role if we want to target a compound to a specific tissue inside the human body. There can be different mechanisms involved in the release from a formulation. During synthesis, commonly a fair amount of free drug remains inside the formulation, this is what happens initially after the injection. We have a dispersion of this drug and this is usually responsible for the burst release. Also, we have the dissolution. The solubility of the compound matters a lot. And last but not least, we also have the dissociation of the compound, which is because of specific interactions between the compound and the matrix material that we choose. When it comes to nanoformulations, a lot of people talk about the different mechanisms of drug release. However, I like to distinguish between the mechanism and the drivers of drug release as well. Because when you think about what is the driving force for a certain release, you also contextualize this research in terms of the physiological situation. When you have a nanocarrier, it is initially subjected to a very strong dilution once it is injected into the human bloodstream. And this concentration gradient also leads to further release of the compound. At the same time, you also have an elimination of the compound from blood circulation and a considerable plasma protein binding. This all leads to a reduction of the concentration of the drug in the surroundings of the nanocarrier. And this also leads to more drug release. Which formulation parameters actually matter for the in vivo situation? In many cases I just have to say I don't know. We all know that the particle size and the size distribution plays a certain role when it comes to the in vivo circulation time, which is the time that a nanocarrier can circulate in the human bloodstream before it is eliminated. But this also depends on a number of other parameters that are involved, for example the surface charge which is responsible for surface interactions with proteins or with tissues. These are properties which are very hard to predict in vitro, at least with the current cell-based in vitro assays that we have. This is also why we use a lot of in vivo models when it comes to nanomedicine to make predictions how nanocarriers will behave in the human body. For other parameters, such as the drug release and the release rate, my own group just recently established a so-called in vitro in vivo correlation, which means that we found a direct relationship 
between the in vitro findings in the experimental setup and the in vivo pharmacokinetic profile. Whenever you establish such a relationship, it is very useful because it tells you that the formulation property actually reflects a therapeutic performance of your nanosystem. Something that we started quite early to investigate was finding new methods to analyze the drug release from nanocarriers. It actually matters a lot which method you choose to analyze the drug release. Many of the methods that are described in the literature put a lot of pressure on your nanocarrier system and this also forces out the drug and this may not be reflective of the in vivo situation. So basically there are two different areas which are very often mentioned when it comes to drug release testing sample and separate methods and dialysis methods. We tried to choose kind of a system which uses the best of both worlds and we came up with a dispersion releaser technology that you can see here. Measuring the particle size of a drug delivery system can be as complicated as measuring the drug release. And there are particular reasons for that. Every analytical method in the world comes with certain disadvantages. So does dynamic light scattering, which is really a standard technique that many of you may have in your laboratories. However, you have to know about the error sources of this method. In particular, when you want to measure your drug delivery system in a situation which matters for the in vivo context, for example in presence of serum proteins or lipids, in these cases, you have to know that all colloidal impurities will also cause light scattering and that they may change the particle size you are measuring. And this is what makes it so complicated. You have to run appropriate controls. Some of the newer methods, such as NTA, nanoparticle tracking analysis, are very good in this context because they also provide an image analysis. One thing my group was particularly interested in over the last couple of years was modeling the in vivo behavior of nanomedicines. The reason is that we have so many data sources. We have our in vitro assays, for example, in vitro drug release. We have particle size analysis and we have a lot of cell based models. And also we have in vivo data from rodents, but also from humans. In silico modeling is a way to contextualize this information, to put it into a bigger picture. And this is what we are trying to do. We try to understand what happens later with a nanomedicine in the human, which also influences the therapeutic effect. And this is how such a model looks like. What you can see here is the so-called physiologically based nanocarrier biopharmaceutics model. It uses a lot of different parameters to simulate how nanocarriers behave in the human bloodstream. For example, the dose of the drug delivery system, the release rate of the drug from the carrier and the carrier half-life. For each and every time point, it simulates the plasma concentration time profile, including the carrier bounded fraction and the free drug concentration in the blood plasma. Let us run the model. You can see that the model also determines the so-called accumulated fraction, which is responsible for drug targeting. The performance of the drug delivery system depends on the three parameters of dose, release rate and carrier half-life. If we change the release rate, this also has a tremendous impact on the therapeutic performance. You can use these models to make predictions of how a liposomal formulation will behave in the human. And this is one of the biggest advantages of this research. On the left, you can see the correlation that we achieved. We actually simulated the in vivo behavior of a particular formulation. And later we looked at the real in vivo data and made a comparison. This is the in vitro in vivo correlation that we achieved. In the next step, we can now modify the model and particular parameters in this model to find out how changes in the drug release or the particle size would basically affect the pharmacokinetic profile. Let me quickly summarize my talk for you. What should you have learned? 
Nanomedicines are novel formulations that can be used to deliver drugs to a specific tissue inside the human body. The analytical methods to understand and to measure these nanocarriers are difficult to set up. Some important measurements are, for example, the particle size and the release rate. To put this all into physiological context, in silico modeling is a powerful tool. And the new models that we develop, like the physiologically based nanocarrier biopharmaceutics model, can be used to make predictions for the in vivo situation. Thank you very much in the end for your attention and I hope to see you again, maybe then face to face. Bye bye.